Well, hello, this is Guy Page, publisher of Vermont State House Headliners, back for our third show. Welcome back. Today, I thought I'd take a special look at what the House Judiciary Committee is doing regarding drug reform laws. And by drugs, I mean illegal drugs, narcotics, uh, sales of, of illegal drugs. Uh, there is a, a definite trend of bills that are introduced by Judiciary Committee members into the House Judiciary Committee uh, that seem to have a, a lot in common. And we will go over those in detail today. The highlight here is there's, there are bills that would expunge criminal records for marijuana and hashish possession, decriminalize possession for up to two ounces of marijuana, limit judicial forfeiture of assets. So like when a drug dealer is convicted of something, he can lose his car and his house and his ill-gotten gains, uh, this would limit that. Another bill would reduce hard drug possession from felony to a misdemeanor. And yet another bill would legalize safe spots for drug use. Now understand, I'm not necessarily saying that these are good or bad, but these are all new bills that have been introduced recently into the Vermont House that I think people are interested in. So I'm telling you about it. If you want to receive Vermont State House headliners directly, our column that comes out almost every day now, you can email page communications for vt at gmail.com. That's page communications for the number four, vt at gmail.com. So, back to our drug reform bills. Several bills introduced by members of House Judiciary Committee seek to push back the current legal boundaries on marijuana and heavier drugs. For example, H-251, and you can get a good look at exactly what H-251 says by going to the Vermont Legislature's website. That's www.legislature.vermont.gov. H-251 would expunge misdemeanor marijuana possession convictions imposed prior to legal legalization last year. Uh, we all know that uh, possession of marijuana in a small amount, one ounce or less, became legal July 1 of last year. What this bill would do is, if you were convicted of a marijuana possession before then, that this would expunge that record. It just wouldn't show up anymore. It would be eliminated. It also would decriminalize possession of less than two ounces of marijuana or 10 grams of hashish. So that's twice as much marijuana as was uh, legalized last year in the legalization bill. Uh, twice as much would be decriminalized. Decriminalization is, uh, it's not exactly legalization. Decriminalization is like getting a parking ticket or a speeding ticket. It's a, it's a civil fine. So it doesn't go on your criminal record, uh, but on the other hand, it's not a completely legal activity either. So this would be decriminalized possession of less than two ounces of marijuana or 10 grams of hashish. The sponsors for this bill, H-251, are Maxine Grad, Chairman of House Judiciary, Celine Colburn and Barbara Rachelson of House Judiciary, two Burlington members, and also Sam Young of Glover, who is the lead sponsor for the, the House's Tax and Regulate Retail Sale of Marijuana Bill. So, as I said, right now it's legal to possess up to one ounce of marijuana. This would double that, at least to make it a decriminalized amount. Uh, two ounces of marijuana is enough marijuana, I am told, for about 120 joints. Depends on the strength of the marijuana, of course, but figure about 120 joints for two ounces of marijuana. Now, one of the arguments for 
legalizing possession of marijuana is that, well, they're already selling it. Uh, why not just, just completely legalize it? And that way, maybe it'll help get rid of the black market. What seems to have happened after, since the bill was passed and went into effect of July 1 of last year, is that in our larger towns and cities anyway, the black market seems to have picked up. I've heard this at various forums. And for example, uh, there was a, uh, the owner of the Good Times Gallery, that's right across Church Street from City Hall, literally in the shadow of Burlington City Hall. The owner was arrested for the, the sale of marijuana on a, on a federal charge. Uh, and I've read in, in seven days that uh, there were uh, the, the sales involved edibles, which is a highly concentrated form of, uh, can be a highly concentrated form of marijuana, and there were teenagers there as well. So uh, apparently, the, what's, to some degree, what is happening is that the legal pot, grown legally or possessed legally, is emboldening the, the sale, the illegal sale of marijuana, which has uh, T.J. Donovan, our attorney general, and others saying, well, I guess we might as well just go for a full tax and regulate, retail sale, open up the stores and cultivate in Vermont. Might as well do that because obviously something's not working. Uh, again, uh, that's being done in Colorado and other states. And there, in those states, the black market is thriving. The idea that you can legalize your way out of the black market just doesn't seem to work in the real world. So, another bill, H-250, that is a tax and regulate marijuana bill, is in House Judiciary, and that's exactly like the bill that is running its way through the Senate right now. And I th in fact, I think today, as we speak, it is February 19th, and I believe it was approved in the Senate today. And the only difference between the Senate tax and regulate bill and the House tax and regulate bill is that the Senate bill doesn't collect as much taxes. It collects about 10 percent. The House bill would collect about 20 percent. And why this is important is that uh, Governor Scott has said that, look, if we're going to have a tax and regulate marijuana retail scheme the way Colorado and other places do, we need to get the money from this to, to set up the whole regulatory infrastructure, which will cost millions of dollars, to get a state lab going, and to have education and prevention for our youth and more public safety on the highways, and all of which is, costs a ton of money. In fact, the state tax commissioner estimated it will take a, at least a 26 percent tax on marijuana to, to raise this money, just, just to pay for these expenses. No one anymore is talking about we're going to help pave the roads and, and teach our kids with marijuana money, because the only question is, will they be able to raise enough money with legal retail tax and, tax and regulate? just to cover the costs of legalization. And the Senate bill says 10 percent, the House bill says 20 percent, but the ad administration and their tax people have said we need at least 26 percent. So already, already, the two bills that are, that are in play right now uh, would apparently not cover the costs of, of uh, tax and regulate marijuana the education, prevention, public safety, and regulatory costs. So, <clears throat> moving on to some other bills out of the marijuana realm and into the realm of, of harder drugs. There is a bill, H-102, which would legalize so-called safe drug consumption programs. That would be like uh, safe spaces to shoot up, shoot up 
needle exchanges. Uh, this would not only legalize these, but would limit criminal liability or civil forfeiture for the users, for the staff, and for the organizers of these programs. It would protect them from the government coming in saying, whoa, that's an illegal activity and we're going to arrest you and, and seize your assets. Uh, this would be so that drug users would have a safe space to come and shoot up, get new needles, presumably not reusing the same dirty ones, get advice on treatment, receive assistance in case of an overdose. Uh, the idea is that uh, they're going to do this anyway, and so why not do it in as safe a way as possible and leave open possibilities for treatment and for, for getting off the drugs. Uh, that, that's the, the benefit of it. Uh, critics of it say that it, it really just, in a way, sort of legalizes and enables the practice as well. Uh, that it shouldn't be, should not be making it easier. Uh, I'm not expressing an opinion one way or the other, uh, but I'm just saying that this bill would definitely legalize that, set it up, make it doable. Also, H, this one, this one's interesting, folks. Uh, H-151 would limit the forfeiture of assets of accused criminals organized crime criminals, including drug dealers, by eliminating judicial forfeiture in the case of plea bargains. So judges could only seize the property of a convicted person if the alleged perpetrator, not always but often a drug dealer, is convicted of the underlying offense. But if the accused criminal cops to a lesser plea, there could be no forfeiture. So you have a situation where you have someone who's arrested for being a drug dealer. And he's got maybe a nice home, he's got a nice boat, he's got a car, uh, his, his ill-gotten gains, as it were. And the prosecutor uh, has got a good case against him, but they know that, boy, if they just plead to a somewhat reduced charge, they know he's going to plead guilty and they won't have to go through the time and expense and the possibility that maybe the jury sides with, sides with them. Uh, it's an easier thing to do, let's just, let's just plea this out. Well, if you plea it out, uh, no forfeiture of assets, this law, this law says. Can't do that. So, uh, makes the, makes the, uh, Police and the judges work harder and, in a way, kind of protects the assets of the convicted uh, drug, drug criminal. The other thing about this, as a lot of people know, that what happens to these assets once they're, once they're seized? Well, uh, after their, a lot of the benefits of that, the proceeds, goes, go to law enforcement. They go back to our, our police and our prosecutors and our, our law enforcement system that is doing their best to, to limit and stop drug crime. And they, they take these proceeds and sometimes they actually use the, the vehicles themselves. Sometimes they sell them and taxpayer burden is uh, greatly relieved because the, the drug dealer no longer has his ill-gotten gains, his or her ill-gotten gains, and instead has been, that's been converted to the benefit of, of law enforcement, of keeping people safe. Well, this law, this bill, H-151, would say no more of that. The police don't get these assets anymore. In fact, the assets would go, oh, they go to us. They, they go to the, the general fund, the state of Vermont general fund, which is overseen by the Vermont legislature. So, uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the bills and aimed at reducing uh, drug crimes, they say, look, we're just, we're, we're just trying to help these poor addicts who are, who are caught in this, and we're trying to help them not just send them away to jail, but help them get treatment. Uh, maybe have them uh, approach police and the authorities without 
without a, th a threat of, of being uh, arrested quite so much and, uh, and actually looking for help. This bill would really seem more to be aimed at uh, just no other way I can really see this except that uh, a, a drug dealer uh, could uh, plea to a, to a, lesser, a lesser charge and not have his car, boat, house seized. Uh, it, it seems to, to benefit the, the, the bigger fish. So I'd like to know more about that, and I think maybe Vermonters would too. So another bill, H-103 would restructure drug possession laws to make possession of marijuana, cocaine, LSD, and other illegal drugs a misdemeanor and possession with intent to sell as a felony. So right now, uh, possession of these hard drugs is a felony. This bill would say, nope, not a felony. Uh, because as, as I mentioned before, there's, there's a real feeling that if you remove the barrier of the felony, that they, the drug user is more likely to, to seek help from the system, from police, from whomever, uh, rather than uh, hiding and suffering in the shadows. And I guess, I don't know. Uh, I'd, it'd be interesting to see how that, how that does play out. Uh, there's another angle here, though, is that the backers of turning uh, these felonies into misdemeanors also for several years have been promoting the idea of not just misdemeanors but decriminalization of possession of all hard drugs. A couple years ago, the same supporters who were backing H-103 in a House Judiciary Committee meeting a couple weeks ago, a couple years ago they were in House Judiciary talking about how great it is that Portugal, for example, has completely decriminalized its, its hard drug laws. So there's a lot of concern whenever you're talking about drug reform of the slippery slope. We saw it with marijuana. It went from, from uh, being a, a crime to medical marijuana to decriminalization to simple possession, and now this year, possibly to uh, selling it on in stores. And there are people who do wonder if the same thing may be happening with hard drugs. That moving from a felony to a misdemeanor in this bill, and perhaps eventually to decriminalization, and who knows, maybe complete legalization. There's another bill uh, along those lines. Uh, H-182 would transition our correction system to mental health rehab clinics, which in a way sort of makes sense, that if you're going to, if you are going to completely legalize or decriminalize drug use, and if a lot of our criminals are in having to do with the drug trade, either possession or sales or whatever, if that's why they're in jail, then if, if you're going to stop looking at this as a crime and more as an addiction that needs to be treated, and it's a mental health problem that, that they need help with, then it does sort of make sense to transition your correction system to a uh, to a mental health facility. Uh, of course, there are many other crimes, and it's no, I think no one is saying that you're going to just completely uh, get rid of jails and open mental health clinics, but I think they're moving in that trend, and that may be one reason why, is that the, the whole emphasis on treating drugs as a crime uh, may be changing, and therefore your, your correction system needs to change too. And there's a, 
There's sort of an ironic ending to this, I think. I was in the State House this morning and a senator was walking down the stairs and she knew that I'd been very active in uh, s stopping uh, smoking in the workplace, for example, y years ago, the smoking in the workplace laws. And she looks at me and says, hey, we're working together again. I said, really, what are you talking about? She said, well, we're, we're working on getting the smoking age, tobacco, smoking age raised from 18 to 21. And which, I'm not saying right or wrong on that, but I do know the, the rationale that they give is that brains of 18 to 21 year olds are still developing, the judgment is still uh, in process, and a, a lot of young people start smoking tobacco between the age of 18 and 21. Therefore, let's just make the sale of it illegal because maybe they'll smoke it less. But the same thinking does not seem to apply quite as well with marijuana and other drugs. And in one case, they're, they're making the law tougher because they want to discourage it with tobacco, but that doesn't quite seem to be playing out with, with the marijuana and maybe even other drugs as well. So uh, that's the latest I have for you. That's, these are some of the bills that are in the Judiciary Committee. Doesn't mean that they're all going to get passed. Doesn't really mean that any of them will be passed into law. Uh, that's, that's what the committee hearings are for. That's what the votes on the floor of the House and the Senate are for. And then the governor finally has to decide whether he wants to veto something or sign it or just let it pass into law. There's a lot that has to happen between now and then. But it all starts with a bill being introduced. And certainly the tenor of the bills that have been introduced about drug use are going towards making it less of a crime, making it more legal. And we'll see where it goes. Uh, this is Guy Page. Vermont State House Headliners, thank you for listening.